Hello! Today um, I drew my final round game, which meant I finished on four and a half out of uh, nine, uh, which was a little bit of a disappointing tournament for me, to be honest. I should really have gained points. I had, uh, as I mentioned before, I had a force mate in round one, which I failed to deliver on. It was the only time in my career that I failed to win from a force mate. And then later in the tournament, well, even in round two, I was better. I should have played on. That was a perfect decision. Sometimes you get punished when you take draws early. I should have played on that game. And then later on, um, uh, I I resigned in a a drawn position or an equal position. uh, So that was also bad. So there were some real disasters. And again, same sort of thing happened today. Now, a couple of people met. I, I chatted to a guy earlier, I'm trying to remember his name. I'm so bad at remembering names. Really nice guy who was playing in a tournament. He follows my channel, so shout out to him. Uh, I've already forgotten his name, even though he told me about five minutes ago. Uh, but he mentioned the fact that he, I should have like a like a uh, board when I'm doing these videos, which is absolutely true, to take people through the game. The problem is I don't have a laptop, so I'm doing it on a tablet. I'm not sure how to screen record the board on a tablet. This is why I'm just doing the video. So apologies for anyone who don't know what I'm talking about. However, I do link the live game down below so people can play through. So just to mention today, I played against uh, some charming player. had a really good tournament, Teodora. I think she tied for first. Although Fernandez may have won on tiebreak because of um, more wins, which I think is a bit harsh. If you lose two games and you win the tournament, and someone else, um, so you got uh, six out of nine. Someone else didn't lose a game. Somehow I feel it should be the other way around, but that's just my opinion. I don't think there should be a tiebreak, right? I don't really agree with tiebreak. It's just to have like joint winners. But anyway. So he had a really good tournament, a uh, really charming person. Uh, we went for post-mortem. And at some point, um, I, 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 went, I went down this line. She said it was like the top line of her prep. And I had a vague memory that I'd maybe looked at this sort of before, where you go like, you allow black to go A4, which clamps the queen side. But um, I've got quite reasonable initiative uh, for that. So Blackout obviously has a very good uh, strategic position, but a little bit passive. So she played this move, Bishop B8, I think it was still in her preparation. Uh, And then later she went F6, (laughs) slightly weakening move, but looks uh, natural. I went back to D3, she took on C4, went Knight F4. Uh, But then I think the critical moment was maybe later on, around about move 22. And she went rook a5, and I think that was maybe the critical moment in the game. And I felt like the position was unbalanced, but... She mentioned that it's moved queen c3. Now, during the game, we were post-mortem, and I said rook b5, queen c7, rook b2, I wasn't so sure about. So when I played d5, on that moment, I was about move 22, 23, I'm not sure. So you can check, it's obviously down below. I went like d5... I could have gone uh, Queen C3, it's absolutely right, that's probably quite a dangerous move. But I think actually during the game I was worried about C6. With a maybe strategic idea of just taking on F4 and going Bishop D5. There's a lot of end games. if black can survive the initiative and my initiative burns out. A lot of the end games are quite good for black because of this uh, weak pawn I have on B2. Uh, so I went d5, trying to make uh, d c7 a weakness. Not sure if that was a good move or not. Obviously, I've not checked it with the engine or anything. Like we did do a post mortem, but d5 was okay, I think. And c played uh, 94. I was probably expecting her to play something else at that point. I was expecting something like knight. Sorry, rook b5. Um. So he went 94, which is quite a reasonable move. My queen's on d3. This is why I blundered, because I should have I should have probably gone um after 94, or maybe I should have gone. Well Queen C4 I thought about, but Queen C4 I didn't like because of um Maybe even c6 because of the pin on the pawn on d5 to the bishop on f7. I don't think taking on c6 quite works. 
So maybe Queen C4 was possible, but the critical move there was maybe Knight E6, but I think that seems to burn out to equality. Maybe, but I think I still think that was better than what I played. Maybe it's also H4 is another option. Uh, no, but H4 is going to take and take on D5, so that's not a good option. So I probably should have tried Knight E6, but I played a blunder. I went Bishop E4. It feels like a blunder because it, I completely overlooked her next move. Bishop takes F4, which is really terrible. This is exactly what's been happening to me, to me of late, just playing too quickly. I mentioned this before that I'm not doing the process of calculation well enough. So I, I was only looking at after bishop e4, rook, uh, say for example, rook takes e4, queen c3, which is very good for white because I take on c7. Or f takes queen c3. So it's really remiss to miss bishop f4. And as soon as he played it, it was like a huge shock to me. So I considered uh, playing bishop g2. And so he could play bishop e5 after bishop g2. Uh, but I was also worried about bishop takes e3, f takes e3, queen e7. And I thought I might be worse because I've got a weak d pawn. She's very active. And I've also got a weak e pawn as well. So uh, I, I saw some line with queen c3. Uh, queen takes e3. Uh, no, not queen e3. Uh, so he goes rook b5, queen c7, queen e3, king h1, rook b2. And if d6, there's stuff like rook takes g2 or queen f2. And I thought I might even lose. So uh, maybe not, but I'm not winning there because rook g2 is minimum perpetual for black, I think. Uh, although after rook g2, think about now there's rook e1, which is kind of a tricky move. It's a very tricky position, but I mean, rook g1, maybe there's bishop d5 actually. Bishop d5, rook, sorry. Yeah, so it's it's some weird, there's some weird weirdness going on there. There's bishop d5, rook e3, rook takes uh, g3 uh, check, and his force checkmate. So, um, so in this uh, variation, he played. Um, so, I, I, I basically tried to bail out. I, I realized I blundered, and rather than tilting and trying to go for a non existent advantage, at least I kind of recalibrated. I did something sensible in that game. Which is a basically try and bail out to an opposite color bishop's end, ending, and um, but then I miscalculated that as well because I didn't need to go g4 later on. I thought I was getting mated after h3, forgetting that when she goes rook d1, I can always go rook c1, which she pointed out. So that was also, and at the end, I thought she might play on actually. I was a little bit concerned she'd play on and try and win, but uh, obviously, a draw was like decent money for her. I mean, I would have got the same amount of money if I'd drawn or won. Like, the only thing was a loss. Like, I lost pictures. Uh, Arthur pictures would have got more points than me. The uh, Netherlands guy. So, he would so he would have got a lot, not more points, but he would have uh, beaten me on tiebreak because he beat me in an individual game. So, that game was a draw last round. Obviously, I'm losing about three rating points. I thought earlier, I thought of a good analogy for my chess career. It's like a horror film on Netflix called The Platform. And uh, it's where you basically two guys on this platform. They're going up and down, and they're having there's, there's food that comes down to the platform. The food comes down to the platform. Actually, they stay on the same level, but the food comes down to the platform, and they can maybe move levels as well, right? But uh, it's a little bit like that with my chess career. I'm like at the moment I'm on a twenty four twenty platform, and I'm 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 resting there for maybe a few years, and then eventually I will go down. And then, uh, then I'll probably stabilise at the next level for a few years, and then I'll go down. The only people going up are like the younger players who are like motivated and they're really working hard on their chess and they're just young and they've got loads of confidence. They're like some of the players playing in this tournament. But overall, I enjoyed the event. You know, it's in Bruges, it's a really nice place. The only thing I would say about Bruges, I think it's not as good as Ghent actually because a lot of the, I'd sense in a lot of the restaurants I don't really like um tourists that much as compared to like Ghent I feel like uh, they're not that friendly and you have a lot of these outdoor places but I always feel intimidated when I go to those outdoor places on my own I don't really feel comfortable eating there <coughs> so I tend to eat inside but one or two of the places I found that were quite rude so I think they're having a problem with tourism 
and they see English people like arrogant sort of tourists don't bother to learn language you know the only uh, Belgium I know is Danka anyway so thanks for watching all these blogs I hope you enjoyed uh, watching when I get back I'll try and do some actual chess positions maybe uh, go over some of the key points from this tournament and um, talk about them in more detail but thanks for watching anyway yeah so not a great tournament for me but not a total disaster either I'll, I'll go to the prize giving later and pick up my 100 euros